of you are so interested in finding out more about Millicent John Ryan Kitzner. Now, a few of you do actually know me, and I'll hope that maybe some of you who do actually know me became because of me. But 90% of you came because of Millicent, and that's fine. I do want to say that I appreciate the fact that uh, Linda let me, is going to let me introduce myself. And I'm not going to do very much uh, in the, by way of introduction because I'm going to tell you certain things during the course of the presentation about myself, as we'll know a little bit more as we go along. But I, like I said, uh, a large number of you uh, know me personally and wouldn't believe all of the nice things that Linda would feel compelled to tell you about me anyway. <laughs> and those of you who don't know me want to see the presentation, and you won't believe uh, that the presentation is good until it's done. The proof will be in the pudding, I hope. So let's get started. But before I actually get started, uh, I, I know because I personally have had the pleasure of meeting a number of uh, Millicent's uh, family members over the course of the, this past year of research, but anybody who is actually related to Millicent Lyon Kissmiller, would you raise your hand, please? <laughs> Okay. When I 
did start talking to people in the community, and I know a lot of uh, lifelong Carlilians, so I knew people, even my own age, who, uh, were, who knew Millicent uh, when they were growing up. When I first started talking about Millicent uh, Lyme Pitzmiller, invariably, the first thing people said to me involved silver dollars, which I also heard referred to as love dollars. And evidently, she gave uh, silver dollars away at many, many opportunities, as Halloween treats, as gifts to people who came to her home, uh, as uh, tips to people who provided either services or small um, gestures of friendship to her. She also gave away boxes of Russell Stover assorted chocolates and candy apples, and she enjoyed buying uh, bouquets of red carnations with big red bows from George's flowers. <coughs> and she kept these uh, bouquets herself or gave them away to friends. So she was obviously a very, very generous person in a lot of ways. But she was contradictory in her uh, attitudes towards generosity as well. One of the things that we're going to kind of notice as we go through this uh, program today is that Millicent was quite eccentric and had some uh, contradic contradictory aspects of her personality. One of the ways she was contradictory was in, in that, uh, even though she was so generous with the silver dollars and the other gifts that she gave to people, she was known within her family as being a poor tipper. <laughs> and I was told that members of the family would stay behind uh, when they went out to eat at a restaurant and until Millicent left, and then they would add money to the tip that she had left on the server. Now, this particular story resonated with me because that is exactly what happened with my own father as, as he got older. And my daughter and I would hang back as uh, Grandpa left the restaurant so that we could make sure that there was an adequate tip. So that's not uh, only a Millicent characteristic. She also had a habit of requesting a discount wherever she got a service. It didn't matter whether there was a service that was going to be done at the apartment or whether it was a uh, discount that she was asking for at a shop, including the shops that were owned by her own family members. <laughs> and if she didn't immediately get the she was known to shed just a slow tear or two. <laughs> but then, contradictions coming back into it, when the uh, delivery was made from the shop where she had bought the uh, part, sold the uh, item on discount, she would give a very generous tip to the delivery person. <laughs> I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with the word serendipity or how many of you use it in your own lives on a regular basis, but serendipity is one of my favorite words. It is also one of my favorite experiences, and I'm happy to say that it's an experience that happens to me fairly frequently. Serendipity, as you probably know, is the chance encounter of good things in places that you don't expect them. And uh, Alexander Fleming and the discovery of penicillin is by far the most famous example of serendipity. I can't say that any of my own personal encounters of separate serendipity have been as spectacular as penicillin, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're special to me. And this whole presentation comes about because of an experience of serendipity almost exactly a year ago. <clears throat> I belong to a group of um, YMCA members who are part of the water aerobics class on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 8 o'clock uh, at the YMCA. And over the years, by the way, would everybody who's in my 8 o'clock uh, YMCA water aerobics class please raise your hand? Come on, Jack. Come on, six, seven, eight. Okay. Uh, this is probably the same group that had this serendipity experience with me almost a year ago. All of, we have gotten into the habit over the years of stopping after class in the lobby of the YMCA. Is this thing actually on? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Can everybody hear me without yeah. this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, a number of us have gotten into the habit after class of stopping into the lobby of the YMCA to stay and have coffee and conversation. I was actually going to say at one point in time, weak coffee and strong conversation, but then I decided there was no reason to rely on the YMCA's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Even though, truth be told, it is fairly weak. But it's nice of them to provide coffee at all, so I'm not going to be uh, negative about that. Almost a year ago, I came out of the locker room, and my good friend Helen Beckner, who is a member of my water aerobics class, and her wonderful husband Dick, were sitting at the table with several other friends. 
and Dick was telling stories about Millicent Kissmiller. <laughs> because Dick and Helen had lived in the Kissmiller apartments between 1959 and 1961, on the same on the ground level floor of the apartments. So they had actually lived right next door to Millicent and had gotten to know her quite well. And some of the stories that Dick was telling had me falling off the chair. <laughs> they were so funny. At the end of that conversation, I said to Dick, Dick, we have got to get together and collaborate, either on a presentation at the Historical Society or an article. I'll find out if it's ever been done. I came back and I talked to Linda Whitmer. She said it had never been done. So here we are. We're getting ready to do it. And my stories may not be told quite as well as the way uh, Dick told them, but uh, they were hilarious when Dick told them. <laughs> This particular slide is uh, important for a number of reasons. Um, many of you will know that the uh, Kitzmiller uh, apartments are built from stones that came to, into Millicent's possession after the train station was uh, demolished. And it, this, the first example of my knowing anything about Millicent Kitzmiller at all was in 2001 when we first moved here. And my daughter and I were walking around <coughs> neighborhoods in Carlisle that we weren't familiar with. And we walked down South Street, and we came to the corner of South and Park Street, and we kind of turned around a little bit, and I went, oh my gosh, that's an unusual looking set of apartments. And it wasn't until later that I found out that the uh, apartments had actually been built of stones from the uh, demolished uh, train station. It was also much, much later, and I'll tell you about that uh, towards the end of the presentation, that I found out about the green mortar in the apartments. And I don't know how many of you have ever gone by the apartments and looked carefully, but all of the stones are held together by a unusual uh, color green mortar. And my daughter and I looked and looked and looked and, and said to each other, what on earth is the story behind the green mortar? I'll be able to tell you about that later. Here are some pictures of the uh, apartments uh, the, uh, right around the time that uh, Millicent uh, built them in 1941. In fact, in the lower right-hand corner photo, you'll see a picture of Millicent and uh, family members or friends having a picnic in the courtyard. And Millicent referred to the apartments as her uh, dream house. And she had, in fact, actually had a dream about building these uh, apartments. At first, she, uh, she got the stones, and at first she thought she was just going to build uh, a house, and then she decided she would build the apartments, live in the apartments herself, and also rent uh, apartments out to other people. A very interesting story uh, about the um, courtyard here on the lower right-hand side comes from Dick. At one point in time, now we're talking about the late 50s, remember, uh, Millicent had built a fountain in that courtyard. It's no longer there, but uh, there was a fountain made out of a basically just a pile uh, in no particular <laughs> shape of stones with a, mortar, a motor to uh, run the water through the stones and lights coming up through the stones and lights coming down on the stones. And she had this um, fountain cleaned every spring. And within a month or two, <clears throat> debris would accumulate, leaves, various things, and the uh, water fountain would stop working. And Milton would look and moan and say, my dream house is turning into a nightmare. <laughs> so the, the fountain was not that big a success. But other parts of it were uh, a huge success. And uh, there was a paper here in our library done by a woman named Diane Coleman about the architect who uh, built the Kissmiller apartments, a man named James W. Minnick from Camp Hill. And he used the international style with elements of Frank Lloyd Wright's style to build the apartments. That's why it's so obviously modern looking compared to the rest of the uh, neighborhood uh, buildings, houses. The apartments contain built-in bookcases, cupboards, and niches set off by natural mahogany doors and parquet floors, and this is Ms. Coleman's paper notes uh, that Millicent personally went to New York to bring home the doors and the windows. She went to New Jersey to accompany the copper plumbing fixtures. And she went to Kentucky to bring home the wood for the parquet floors. So she obviously had a very personal interest in this uh, building of this apartment. In fact, uh, the architect, uh, Mr. Minnick, uh, was quoted as saying that her uh, interest in the apartments was sometimes an obstacle to his successful <laughs> And on at least one case, uh, occasion, she went to his office and left the payment of $4,000 in coins and change. <laughs> now, I don't happen to know if there were any silver dollars in that payment. Uh, a story that I learned just last 
week, and I told a couple of people here, I, I have been doing research off and on for the last year, and it became obvious to me uh, a couple of months ago that I needed to quit talking to people about Millicent Wine and Spiller because I was getting so much information I was never going to be able to include it all in my presentation. But this story that I heard last week was so good I, I couldn't uh, avoid including it. Uh, towards the end of um, the time that she lived in the apartments, she received a uh, assessment, a property assessment for tax purposes that she thought was entirely too high. So she, I mean, how many of us have gone through that experience ourselves? So she hired Bob Jacobs, a local attorney, who eventually became Judge Robert Lee Jacobs of the Superior Court, <coughs> to represent her at the hearing where she wanted to complain about her assessment. Uh, Mr. Jacobs agreed to represent her, but he made her promise that she wouldn't say a word. <laughs> so she sat there very quietly while Mr. Jacobs proceeded to tell the people at the hearing about the flaws in the apartments, the problems that the apartment had, the things that would lower her assessment because they, they were uh, problematic in the construction or in the uh, quality of the apartment. Millicent listened for as long as she could. And then she stood up and in a great puff, Denied everything that was Mr. Jacobs. <laughs> every statement that you made and said, how could you possibly talk about my dream house in that way? <laughs> Needless to say, her property assessment was not low. <laughs> Paper 
number of days. So Dick explained to the man from Pomeroy's. He signed the piece of paper, and he did come back. <laughs> now, I mentioned to you my fondness uh, of the word serendipity. And the first case of serendipity that I described to you was uh, right out of the YMCA lobby and uh, hearing Dick tell the stories that led to this presentation. The second case of serendipity was when I found out uh, that Millicent Kitzmiller's maiden name was Lyme. And I tried desperately to find a way to connect her with Albert Allen Lyme, who was a uh, local photographer of great note and prodigious uh, production. Uh, who we are lucky enough to have approximately 3,500, that's 3,500, of his glass negatives in our collection. And for almost three years of my life, off and on, at various times as a volunteer, I took uh, photos that had been uh, developed from these glass negatives and scanned them into our uh, search engine, our past perfect search engine. So I was very, very familiar with Albert Allen Line and very fond of his photography, and I wanted desperately to find a connection between Albert Allen Line and Millicent Line Kitzmiller. I never was able to track a direct family tree kind of a connection, and then one day I found this photograph. And in this particular photograph, which is a Line family reunion, I'm going to stand in front of you. I don't have a laser or a pointer, so I'm going to stand in front of you. This gentleman right here in the middle is Albert Allen Line. This lady right here is Millicent Lyon Kitzmiller. And this, and this is her mother, Catherine Spots Lyon. This is, um, oh, a little bit cut off. I'm sorry about that. This is uh, her daughter, Gladys. And this is her daughter, May, who is with us here in the audience today. So I finally had my connection between the Millicent Lyon Kitzmiller and Albert Al <coughs> Lyon. And I was so happy about that. Uh, Millicent's parents were James Valentine and Catherine Spots line. Uh, her father was a well-to-do farmer who had a farm and a home on Alexander Springs Road. And her grandfather donated the land to build the one-room school that is still recognizable as a one-room school made into a house on Alexander Springs Road. You can still, still see the bell tower if you're very slow and careful when you go around the curb <laughs> where this old schoolhouse was. And uh, Millicent went to that wonder school uh, for a period of time as a, a youngster. But then she moved to what is known locally, uh, by those of us who are in the know, as Line House, which is at 256 South Hanover Street. Now this is an, another case of an interesting coincidence. This is part of the Line collection I actually put this photograph into our collection as a um, um, part of our search engine. And on the back of this, uh, or attached to this photograph, was a typed document explaining the history of Line House, typed by May Kitzmiller Riddlesberger. So I was very happy when I finally got a chance to meet May Kitzmiller Riddlesberger because she had provided a, an a more enormous amount of information about this uh, photograph. Limehouse, uh, Nelson and uh, her family moved into this house in 1902, and it stayed in the family until 1969. That's a whole. Now my third case of serendipity. This is a photograph uh, on the far left you see uh, Millicent's mother, Catherine Spots Line, her sister, Mary Line, Millicent herself, and then her brother, James Harvey Line, more often known as J. Harvey Line. The interesting thing in the case of serendipity is the little girl in the middle of that photograph, Mary Line, became Mary Line Todd. And if you didn't notice as you were coming in, if you would look on your way out, Above the door at the back of the hall, there's a um, brass plaque that tells you that this room is given in, or is in memory of, in honor of, Glenn Todd and his wife, Mary Line Todd. And that is Mary Line Todd that this room is given in honor of. Uh, she went to college, and after college, came to the Carlisle schools. She eventually became the head of the Dickinson College Bookstore and married prominent uh, Carlisle businessman Glenn Todd in 1950. In their married years, uh, the Todds were generous to many local groups, including Dickinson College, 
and the Historical Society. They both died within a month or so of each other in 1973. The young man here on the lower right-hand corner is uh, the elder brother of the family, James Harvey Line, who also graduated from Dickinson, became a lawyer in Carlisle, and his descendants, his descendants, still own uh, jewelry stores here in Carlisle. These photographs are uh, personal treasures to me because uh, they show Millicent at uh, such a young and attractive age. And the uh, photograph, the pair on the lower left and the oval photograph here on the lower right were handed to me by Mae Riddlesberger uh, the first time I went to uh, visit with her. They came off of her dresser and she said, well, you can take these and uh, scan them and include them for the program if you want to. And that was the beginning of my uh, photographs and it just made a, a special place for me. The other photograph came from a series of photographs and photo albums that um, Dan Floor gave to me and allowed for me to scan. And then I also received photographs from um, May's, I told everybody I was going to have trouble with the generations, from May's son, Berklin Riddlesberger, who is known locally as Bud, who now lives in North Carolina. And he sent me a number of photographs that you'll see uh, later uh, by email. So I had a great deal of help from family members in putting together this presentation. But the photos on the far left are of Millicent and Samuel McKee Kissmiller's wedding. The photograph here on the lower right is of their, on their, taken on their honeymoon. And the upper photograph is of uh, Millicent uh, as a young woman. Uh, they, uh, they married in 1907. They lived in Shippensburg for a number of years until they moved to Waynesboro in 1926. And then after Samuel died in 1929, Millicent moved back to Carlisle, back to the house at 256 South Hanover Street. By the way, a friend of mine uh, who was my guinea pig for this presentation on Saturday morning said that I should describe to you where the line house on South Hanover Street is. It's between South and Walnut on the right-hand side of the road as you go south towards Mount Holland. So, and it looks very much it's similar to the photograph that uh, I showed you earlier, except that the roof line has been changed. There are dormers, uh, like a mansard roof and dormers on the roof line now. But when I first started doing uh, uh, research for this presentation, I was interested in Samuel McKee Kissmiller as well as in uh, Millicent. And just like whenever I mentioned Millicent's name to people, the first thing I heard was, oh yes, uh, she gave away silver dollars. The first thing I heard when I mentioned Samuel McKee Kissmiller was, uh, almost invariably, oh yes, he owned half of South Mountain. <laughs> now, I don't know for sure that he owned half of South Mountain, but evidently he owned quite a bit. And he was a very well-known business, businessman and a very <coughs> successful businessman. He was born in 1871 in Shippensburg. He graduated from the state normal school that we now know of as uh, Shippensburg University with honors in 1889. And unfortunately, he died at the age of 58 uh, in 1929 after an illness of a year. His first commercial endeavor was a jewelry store in Shippensburg. And then he joined a bond company in New York City. And they told me stories about how the family used to come from Shippensburg to the train station here in Carlisle, where it was still a uh, train station, to see their father and husband off on the train to New York so that he could work in the bond company in New York, and then he'd come back for the weekends. Later on, he served uh, on the boards and as a director for several well-known uh, companies in Waynesboro. And when he died, he was the president of the reor reorganized Geyser Company, uh, as well as being active in many civic uh, associations in Shippensburg. Both Millicent and Samuel were very active in civic groups as well as in politics. Unfortunately, they were on opposite sides of the political spectrum. <laughs> and they told me that her mother would gather uh, friends and family members together in her car and make sure that uh, they got to the polls on time to, re to vote for the Republican candidates of her choice. <laughs> the joke in the family was that there really wasn't very much use in her father even going to the polls because he was so vastly outnumbered by the voters that Millicent was taking to the polls. <laughs> now. <laughs> Millicent was known for parking tickets. And uh, those of you who are laughing already know 
know some of the stories about the parking tickets. Uh, Millicent had a very eccentric way of parking. She parked where she cared to. Wherever there was a spot that was big enough for her car, she parked. And she accumulated a vast number of parking tickets. And I was told that the way she paid for her parking tickets was that the uh, policemen in the borough, they didn't even have to write the license plate number on the uh, ticket. All they wrote on it was Millie K. They obviously didn't know that she didn't like being called Millie. They just wrote Millie K on the parking ticket, and then when a number of them had accumulated at the borough police station, they would send them over to Millicent's house, and she would pay them, and then they would start a new collection. <laughs> She also had a very personalized way of driving, which was basically just to drive smack dab down the middle of the street, <laughs> without any uh, reference to lines, lanes or lines or anything like that. And she did quite well at it. But a number of people became uh, concerned over the years about her eccentric driving habits and the dangers that it might present to her and to others. And a number of people had the temerity to suggest to her that maybe she give up driving. And Millicent responded, I can't give up driving. I'm too blind to walk. <laughs> Uh, part of a log house. And I, 
I just thought that that was wonderful to see the interior of that log house. So that was a summer cottage uh, near uh, Mount Hollow. The lower photo here is actually of Mary Line Todd, the woman that this hall was named in honor of, and Millicent's sister. And in the lower uh, corner here, the gentleman that you can just see the back of his head, I am told was uh, May's father-in-law, Samuel McKee uh, Rillsberger's father, Henry. Uh, this might be a good time to tell you uh, another story that uh, Dick told me. Uh, and we're talking about genealogy and who's related to who and that sort of thing. One of the things that I uh, first do when I go to uh, do research about a person is to look up an obituary. And if I'm lucky, the obituary has been well written by family members and includes a lot of information. Not only genealogical kind of information, but in information that lets me know what kind of a person uh, has just died and who's being remembered. Well, evidently, uh, once upon a time, uh, Millicent went to a funeral at uh, Ewing Brothers' funeral home, and Seymour Ewing told her that the gentleman who had just died had belonged to more organizations and civic clubs in the county than anybody else in the county. <laughs> <laughs> now, Millie, Millicent was not one to uh, take that sort of a thing lying down. So she went home, and she stayed up for hours that evening with Dick, going through all of her various files and all of her various records, looking to see what organizations she belonged to and how many of them there were. And I'm happy to report that by the end of that time, she had come up with three more than the general. <laughs>
received a pair of skates right there next to his uh, cane. Do you remember those skates, John? <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> Well, I never skated, so. <laughs> and here we have a series of uh, pictures uh, taken at Rehoboth Beach. Millicent had, uh, at, at, at times, uh, two homes uh, at, at, North, at Rehoboth Beach. And she and the family uh, loved to go to the beach. She also took various groups of her women friends to the beach. Sometimes they would be members of Eastern Star. Sometimes they were uh, friends that she had known at Irving College. By the way, I skipped that part earlier. Uh, Millicent went to Irving College and also to uh, Millersville College. Uh, she was at Irving College at the same time Lenore Flower was at Irving College. And she and Lenore were friends. Some of you will remember that Lenore Flower was a very, very well-known uh, civic leader here in Carlisle and local historian. She also was a, a, an arbiter of her own good taste, and she thought that the Kids Miller apartments there in Old Orland were uh, uh, repellent. <laughs> she did not like that architectural structure at, in Old Orland at all. <laughs> but on, at various times, uh, Melissa would take friends to Rehoboth, Rehoboth Beach, and I was told she treated them royally. She made sure that they went out to a nice restaurant for a meal, they went to a movie during their time there, and she slept in a smaller building behind the big house so that she could get her sleep while the younger women and her friends were, you know, moving it up in the big house. But they always spent the evenings together and uh, either sang old gospels or uh, family tunes and played the piano, which Millicent really loved. And she also loved to play Beyond the Sunset on the piano herself. She also enjoyed uh, fishing in her son-in-law uh, Shook's uh, boat. Now that would have been Gladys's husband Harry's boat. And she, when they caught the fish, they had a big fish fry. She went crabbing, and uh, they would sometimes have crab. And I can't identify all of the people in these photographs, but you can tell that in each photograph at the beach that Millicent is having a lot of fun and really enjoying herself. I told you that I would tell you more about green water. <laughs> This is serendipity number five. Totally unexpectedly, I was at a meeting which happened to be about the extension of the Cumberland Valley Rail Trail from Newville to Carlisle. And I was talking to a friend who happens to be here tonight, and she said, you know about the green water at the Kiss Miller Apartments, don't you? I said, no, tell me about the green water. And she said, well, I, what I heard was that when Millicent dreamed about her dream house, the dream house had green water between the stones. Makes perfect sense to me. And so now we all know about the green water. And as you look at some of the uh, carnations that uh, Millicent loved to have of her own or to give to other people, I just want to say that in all of the conversations that I've had during the past year, I, and I've talked to a lot of people of a lot of different ages, I have never heard a single person have a negative thing to say about Millicent Kissmiller. Yes, we laughed together. She had a lot of uh, eccentric habits that were amusing, and I'm sure she would have enjoyed laughing at them as much as we have enjoyed laughing at them. We laughed and we shared memories of a warm, kind, gracious woman. And as I conclude, I would like to read uh, some uh, that was written in the Sentinel in an editorial. Now, this is not an obituary. This was in an editorial that was published in the Sentinel one, almost exactly a week after Millicent's death, and I quote, Gone from the Carlisle scene is Mrs. Millicent Lyne Kistler, a kind, jovial, generous, and gracious lady who was an integral part of the life of the community for many years until she <coughs> passed to her just reward on June 19th last. A person of many fine qualities, always busy and always trying to help others along life's pathway. Mrs. Kitzmiller immensely enjoyed life and living and the opportunity to promote her chosen homeland. She was a good and wholesome woman, throughout life strong, mentally, morally, and spiritually. She gave not only of her time, but of assets, pecuniary and otherwise, usually in her own peculiar ways, <laughs> usually quietly and anonymously. She disliked fuss and publicity. She preferred to help in a quiet, unobtrusive manner, and that she indeed did to the best of her ability. I want to thank all of you for coming today, and I want to see if anybody has any questions.
share another one that I have heard that her. When they first put parking meters in Carlisle, she went up, she was so enamored with them that she went up and down the, the street putting pennies in the parking meters. But when she got back to her own car, she had a parking <laughs> <laughs> any other stories or any uh, questions? Yes. I have two. My name's Roger Irwin, and uh, in the 1940s, I lived in the Moreland area, and on snowy days when Nelson would come out, I thought she had a Cadillac, but I'm not sure. She had big bumpers on the front and the back, and us boys, when she starts slowly up the street, would run behind the car, crazy and dumb and stupid, and then grab a hold of a big bumper and she bring us right up to the car. <laughs> Five miles an hour. All I had to do was be careful not to get behind the exhaust. Right. The other story was uh, in the 1950s, uh, a friend of mine, Ernie Riesinger, had a Bible study. Uh, a luncheon and Bible study on Friday afternoons at the James Wilson Hotel. And I, as I recall, almost every Friday when I attended, uh, Nelson would come to the James Wilson Hotel for lunch. And in the lobby was a big uh, fountain. And she would always come and throw a coin, not silver dollars, I'm sure, because <laughs> I would reach them. <laughs> and she'd throw a coin in and we'd say, what was your wish? And she always said, I want to go to heaven when I die. That's, that's true. I said, she got that wish. Let me just, uh, before I ask uh, over here, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the Cadillac's uh, idea because that was one of the other things that I found out. Not only does she not like, uh, the, uh, in terms of common misconceptions, not only does she not like being called Millie, which I was told she did, she preferred Millicent, lots and lots of people uh, believe that she drove Cadillacs. Her vehicle of choice was a Buick. And that, so I forgot to mention when I had that slide up there with the old Buick, but that was a 1961 Buick, not 